Um, so say that again. What's the inverse of XOR AL 5A? XOR 5A. Yeah, XOR AL 5A. So XOR is, is fun like that. Since what, and this is why I like to think of it is, as this is your math saying which bits to flip. If you do that once, the way that you get your original back is you just flip those bits again. Um, so it is its own inverse. And that's, that's how if you XOR something with 5A in order to get the, the plain text, if you will, that is you XOR it with 5A. Let's see. The other thing I wanted to show before we move on was, yeah, this one. So this is was in the, the malware.exe that we were taking a look at. There was that to code string with the double looping there. Um, I said, OK, well, where's that being referenced? I was just being referenced at one spot. And there's this a string that's being passed. Something else that's being passed to it, when we took a look at, at the decode, it looked like it was, uh, um, was it this one? Arc four. It looked like there was a second argument here. Oh, yeah, and that was being used down here. Um, so the second argument there being passed in came from ECX. And you see this DAG not, and up here this or, well, all of this up to there, let me zoom in just to make sure the folks online see that, okay. So all of this, these six instructions, is a shorthand for string length, where it, it takes the offset to the string, basically pointer to the beginning of the string, puts it in EDI, sets up ECX to be FFFFFFF, basically as, as high as it can go, um, or negative 1 if you're looking at that as a signed integer, sets EAX to 0, and this RECNI SCASB will go through starting with EDI, where EDI is pointing, and will increment that pointer down the line of that string until it reaches zero, because AL is zero. And each time through, it's going to decrement ECX. So what you end up getting the first time, you know, goes through this once, you get ECX is, comes out of this, it's, it's essentially FFFFFF E. Third time through, if it hasn't found the zero, it's FFFFFB. So you're basically counting down from this. So in order to, and when it, it stops doing that, when it reaches the null byte at the end of the string. So in order to convert what's in ECX to the actual string length, not decrement by one. And you end up having the string length. And that's just a, a, a shorthand or just a, a quick way of doing string length that you will come across. So when you see Repni SCASB, just try to remember that Sterling. That's worth knowing. Especially any kind of decoding of, of strings is, is the main thing. Or any kind of uh, string manipulation, string handling. OK, before we move on from the decoding, data encoding, decoding section, does anyone have, um, oh, uh, I totally forgot about this. So one of the things that, uh, <laughs> before we move on, we're going to do more. One of the things that you can do, and, and Alex, you had asked this, is do we script the, the decoding of it? Can we do that? Do we want to do that? Um, it's, it's possible to do that. You can use um, IDA has the, the IDC, or if you're using a, the pay version of IDA, uh, the modern, um, pretty much anything more modern than the free version, comes with IDA Python plugin. 
um, with it, so you can do IDA plugins as well. Um, one of the debuggers we'll be using, Immunity Debugger, um, actually has a Python interface to it, so you can do Python plugins for it. And something I'm going to show you, just to show an example of how do we how do we do that. Um, we're going to take the NDA implant exe, and we're going to go through and we're going to create this, this script, and I'll walk you through some of that of, of how we identify. Um, you know, if we want to run this, as, as some people want to do, yeah, how do bleeding edge? Okay. How do we make sure that we only run the part of it that we that we need to? All right. Close out of this. That. That. Here. Yeah. So what I say? NBA plan. So what we can do is take a look at this first in IDA. And this is something I like to do when I'm when I'm going to be doing debugging. Some of the IDA's debugging isn't um, isn't the greatest in terms of of its feature set, but it's really nice to see stuff in the graphical layout. Hey, look, Stephanie me. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's it's nice to see things in the the graphical layout. So sometimes what I'll do is, if I know I'm going to be debugging something, or as I'm going through IDA. Um, I'll keep IDA up and see the graphical representation and then go into another program like Immunity or Ollie and actually use that for my debugging. Um, so something that we see here is there's a, there's a string here and, and there's uh, another string here and there's this call to this function um, where it's, it's pushing the offset to that string and it looks like well, we're getting the, the stir length of the, the string length of that as well as this other string. Looks like maybe this is going to decode that. If we go in here, we see, hey, bold line. Is the string or Are these moving? Hmm? With, with all the, the uh, diacritic mm -hmm. on the, like the umlauts and such, are, mm -hmm. are those in the normal ASCII set or are those getting out? No, no, those are those are the extended. So basically, values above seven f is going to be that, 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 that. This is just Ida saying, oh, I know this is referenced as a string later on, so I'm going to form it into a string and show you what those bytes look like as ASCII representation. Because Microsoft does strings a little bit differently, right? They use the sixteen bit Unicode. And they've got the length embedded in the data structure. So everything that we've looked at so far has been compiled using Visual Studio. So I'm not sure what you mean by Microsoft does it differently. There, there's a, Microsoft uses, not universally, but they frequently use string encodings that are not, you know, UTF-8. So there's, okay, here we go. This is a good example. Look up privilege value A, register service control handler A. These are the ASCII versions of those um, of those API calls, where it's expecting a ASCII string as for its parameters. There's also uh, W, yeah, W versions, and that's what you're thinking of. If you see the W versions, then there it will be expecting wide character, what you're talking about, strings. And Ida has an awareness of that as well. And it, and it will, I'm not sure. I'll see if I can come up with an example. But, but basically what you're going to get is, is a string, but it's going to say, I forget, over here on the left, over here on the right, it'll say Unicode. I think on the right at the comment. It'll mention, hey, this is a Unicode string. Somewhere in there. But it can identify Unicode strings as well. Okay. But right now, it's just a, a string of bytes 
quite honestly, because it's been obfuscated. Um, so, so it looks like this is maybe the, we got a loop, we got a reading from memory, we got a writing to memory. This, this looks like this is our deobfuscation loop. So I'm going to say, okay, deobfuscate. So this is near the beginning, actually right at the beginning of the binary. And we could, say, technically run through this and, and put a break. Where would we, if we wanted to run this, where would we put the breakpoint to uh, see the deobfuscated string? Right after the call, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much right after the office gate gets called. Um, or you can put it on that and then step over. Either way, you're going to check out, okay, but what is my, what do I get after, after I call the office gate? That's an easy one. Um, so we could, we can set it there. Um, but if this were somewhere in the middle, of your, your binary and other stuff was being called before it, um, you could potentially still run just that piece of code if you knew everything that needed to be set up beforehand and you make sure you call just from, you can say within, we're gonna use immunity debugger to say, okay, I just wanna call from like, you know, here down to here. And if we were to do that, what does it look like? So it looks like obfuscate is taking three arguments. One, two, three. We have offset to that string. ECX, offset to that string. We identified ECX. Looks like it's, it's getting some kind of um, sterling here. Where would we start running? Where would we want to start running in order to get the, the full setup of these arguments. In a little here. Basically it comes down to what is the, since we have this, this offset, offset, it comes down to where is the sterling being set up. You hit any highlight ECX. Yeah. And what did we identify was part of the third line? Uh, are we able to specify numbers that we can push on instead of ECX? So, like, we know that string is, I don't know, 21 yeah. characters long. Yep, yeah. so I was, I was going to, to get into that. Um, so you can identify that, hey, the sterling looks like it starts up here. And let me just run through all that. Or you can say, I, I know what ECX is supposed to be. It's, it's the sterling. Let me find out what that sterling is. You know, like I said, 21 maybe or something. And let me actually put that in my script. And if I show you what the script ends up looking like, it is, so I'm going to get a, instantiate an instance of the debugger, set a register, EIP, which is our instruction pointer to where we want it to start executing, set a breakpoint at that instruction right after the call, and then run. Something else we can do in here is set a register, set ECX equal to 21 or whatever, and then set the breakpoint and run. Um, so that is certainly something that you can do. Um, and then we're running a little short on time, so I won't actually go into this, but you can actually save that. And if you put it in the, uh, the Pi commands subdirectory of, of immunity debugger, um, then you can call it um, down in the, I will, I will just quickly show you what that interface looks like. Um, yeah. So if we run immunity debugger, you have this little command console down here um, where you can enter in bang a and then wider than the string. Make it look smaller. Uh, yeah. 
So what you can do is you can say your basically your script name without the dot pi on it, and that's a bang. And that this is in the uh, on the wiki. You enter it down here and enter, and it runs that um, that script where it goes through and it sets okay, change EIP to the instruction I want to start at, set the breakpoint, you know, maybe set ECX to, to something, and then run it, and it'll run to that breakpoint, and you'll have your decoder. So just be aware you can uh, you can script your debugging um, or your your analysis as you will. Okay, and and just yeah the tools that we went over. Okay. So now before we move on from data encoding, does anybody have questions about data encoding or decoding? So is it easy to do that selective execution with um, community or um, you know the you said that Ida Pro was such a great debugger so maybe you can't do selective execution in, in Ida Pro. Um, if you have the pay version with so one of the languages that I'm comfortable with is Python. Um, Ida has uh, the Python plugin as well that lets you do uh, scripting of, of IDA using Python. So you could certainly do that. Um, the free version has a custom language called IDC. Um, I'm just not that comfortable with IDC myself. Um, the other reason I like uh, Immunity and, and it's basically what it's built off of um, Ollie Dump is some of the plugins that are available for immunity and, uh, sorry, Ollie debug, um, such as Ollie dump that allows you to dump from memory a process and um, dump it out to disk, which makes it very helpful for uh, dealing with hackers, which we're actually going to go over next. So, so they're, they're different products, Ollie and, and immunity? Yes. And are either of them open source? No. <clears throat> But they're both paid licenses, or like no? One of them, one of them is. Make sure I get this right. One of them is freeware, and one of them is shareware. Or not quite sure I'm using the right terms there. You can download both for free. It's just the immunity one. You have to provide email address. This is why, because it's it's a company that wants to market their other tools to you. Okay. I guess I got a real quick question. Yeah. On that, on that uh, example of selective execution, yeah. the idea there was to do that instead of just setting a breakpoint, for instance, so that if there were some other, you identified statically that there's some decoding in the thing. Mm. And you just want to like just decode the string, and you want to make sure that any other you know anti and anything else just doesn't happen. And that's the main point of selective execution. Right, right. If there were other things going on, this this sample um, isn't isn't the best example of that because the, the coding is happening as soon as you start it. But if it were embedded further on down after the system is infected and um, and it does a bunch of, like I said, anti-VM or anti-analysis checks. Um, then we could load it up in the debugger and script to only execute that section of code that does the decoding of the string. When it's simple XOR or XOR and that you know incremental XOR. That's something that's easy to, to just code up yourself in, in Python or something. Uh, what ends up, this ends up being helpful when you have more complicated obfuscation code that can take you a while to figure out what, what exactly is it 
is it doing here? You got all these different embedded loops, and I can go through and do the grouping and the, 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 the pseudocode, and then, or potentially you could just run it if it's not like calling anything else and, and breaking out. So it's a technique to be aware of. Are there any questions from the folks online? 